First organized in 1824, Hendricks County was named for William Hendricks, then governor of the young state. From its humble beginnings, Hendricks County has risen to become the second fastest growing county in Indiana. Located in the heart of the county, just south of the Danville Town Square, lies the Hendricks County Historical Museum. The museum is dedicated to preserving important artifacts that help to tell the story of the residents of Hendricks County. Their collection includes artifacts from the Central Normal College, a space dedicated to military artifacts, and a parlor room decorated with late 18th century furnishings. The Cascade Middle School Pace class has come to the museum to investigate little known artifacts in their collection and help to share their story with the world. Come and join us as we examine this week's episode of The Secrets on the Shelf. Disclaimer, the tooth shown in the following presentation is a mammoth tooth, not a mastodon tooth. Due to miscommunication, the tooth had been labeled wrongly. This discovery came late to our studies, so we have decided it would be best to continue discussing the mastodon. There was indeed a mastodon tooth found in Hendrick County at the same time as the mammoth tooth, hence the mix-up. Our artifact is the mastodon tooth. The tooth shown here is 6 inches long, 10.5 inches in height, and 6.5 inches in width. Mastodon teeth would have been used for grinding down plants that they would eat. Compared to a mammoth's back molar, these teeth had ridges, almost like a washboard. This made them relatively distinct compared to mastodons and modern-day elephants. This mastodon tooth was first found by Clarence Doublefield about 50 years ago. Both the mastodon and the mammoth teeth had been found roughly near the Mill Creek drainage system. Originally, the mastodon tooth was given to DePaul University. After moving stuff around, though, the tooth had been given to Hendricks Historical Museum. The mastodon tooth, and skeleton as a whole, was made the state fossil in July of 2022. There was a lot of back and forth debate before the mastodon became the state fossil. This debate lasted for 10 years and was finally stopped at a 39 to 6 vote in the mastodon's favor. Other fossils like the elegant sea lily were in place for this rule, but that bill never went through. Having the mastodon become the state fossil was proposed by Representative Randy Fry, who had the idea in 2022. Yeah, just put it over there. Hey boss, I found something! What'd you find? I found these beaver teeth in the ground. These don't look like beaver teeth. What are you talking about? You ever seen a beaver? Weird fossils though. I wonder what they're from. The mastodon fossil is stupid. Uh, how could you say such a preposterous thing? The mastodon is such a pure beast of beauty. It was such an inspiring sight at Hanover College. I quite agree with Mr. Fry that it should be the state fossil. Mr. Fry, do you have any real evidence to declare the mastodon to the state fossil? Why, in fact, I do. The mastodon is such a common fossil found in Indiana that it's found in 92 of our counties. That's a pretty common fossil. Certainly something so common should make people think Indiana. Another reason is that Michigan also has the Mastodon as its state fossil, and Michigan has some pretty good taste, not gonna lie. It is decided. The Mastodon is now the state fossil. It was a 39 to 6 vote in the Mastodon's favor. Artifact is George and Eldora Keeney's wedding certificate, dated 1906. The wedding certificate is made of pressed paper and is adorned by the signatures of George Keeney and Amanda Eldora Nelson, and George Leak as a witness, and Charles Brown the officiant. Flowers and other decals cover the page, and the words holy matrimony grace the middle and fancy script. The paper is aged and yellowing, but it's still possible to make up the words and signatures. The dimensions of the certificate is 12 by 18. George Keeney was born in Rainstown, Indiana in 1877 on June 28th. Growing up, he worked on his family farm and attended good schools that led him to attend Central Normal for two terms, graduate from Indiana State Normal in two years, and then moving to Indiana State University in 
to receive an associate bachelor's degree after two years. George completed his education when he attended two terms at Chicago University. Following his schooling years, George went on to teach for eight years. Later on, George became superintendent of the schools for one year at Pittsburgh, one year at Clayton, and two years at North Salem, where he was in charge of seven other teachers. During this time, he also worked in a hardware store, which once had a one-room schoolhouse above it after the original building suffered from damage. It is believed at this time he met and fell in love with the teacher of the school, Amanda Eldora Nelson. Amanda Eldora Nelson was born in Liston, Indiana on January 26, 1878. Eldora's mother died only 22 months after she was born, prompting her and her three siblings to be sent to various relatives. Eldora was sent to her maternal grandparents, James Lawrence and Harriet Amanda Leake, along with her older brother, Franklin. After completing her education at Central Normal College, she became a teacher at a one-room schoolhouse located in Hendricks County. While teaching above a hardware store in Danville, Eldora met and fell in love with George Keeney, who worked there in his spare time. Amanda Eldora Nelson, do you take George Keeney to be your lawfully wedded husband in sickness and in health? I do. George Keeney, do you take Amanda Eldora Nelson to be your, lawf your lawfully wedded wife in sickness and in health? I do. Rings. After getting married, surrounded by family and friends such as George Leake, who gave Eldora away in place of her father, they both moved to Danville and gave birth to Virginia Bell Keeney on October 6, 1919. The family was happy and went on to own both the Keeney Hardware Store and the Keeney Bookstore. With the Keeney Bookstore was primarily run by Eldora. On October 10, 1931, George Keeney died from illness, leaving Eldora a widow and his child fatherless. However, Eldora never married again and was always married to him in her heart. Eldora was an active member of the Danville Methodist Church and later transferred to the New Haven United Methodist Church. She also participated in the Daughters of the American Revolution, Danville Business and Professional Women's Club, and the Browning Club. In 1956, just over two decades after George's death, Eldora published the first of her two no novels, titled Random Thoughts and Miscellaneous Poems. This book was dedicated to her daughter. Her interest in poetry might have been inspired by her participation in the Browning Club. While the book never gained much popularity, it can still be found at Danville and Plainfield Public Library. The book contains poetry that reflects everyday situations and things that were close to her heart. Eldora and her daughter had a close relationship that was reflected after Eldora passed away. Eldora died from illness on January 29, 1974, at the old age of 96, and was buried beside her husband, George Keeney, at the Knights of Pythias Cemetery in Liston. Prior to her death, she and Virginia had been creating Eldora's autobiography, with Eldora writing everything down and Virginia typing it. They were unable to finish it during Eldora's lifetime, but after her death, Virginia and her relative, Ruth Lee Cole, completed it and published the work. This was titled Growing Up in the Gay 90s. It includes her genealogy, many photos, and documentations of her life. Our artifact is the graffiti from the old Hendricks County Jail. Some of this graffiti is over 100 years old. The graffiti on the walls are currently flaking away and won't be around for much longer. From the graffiti, you can visualize what the prisoners' lives were like in jail, what they went through, and how they survived. Graffiti is a form of art that has been around for thousands of years. Cavemen, back before humans knew how to write and talk, would use graffiti as a way to mark their territory. The most famous form of graffiti was to use red clay to put a handprint on stone. This would help protect them and let the others know the territory was taken. Graffiti since then has evolved. People now will use spray paint rather than clay or chalk to make a temporary mark. So many new forms of graffiti have been made. The most common type of graffiti is called tag, which is when people use spray paint to write their name or a small message. Some of the more uncommon types of graffiti are stencil and blockbuster. Stencil is when people use an outline to make something look more realistic. It looks better than just normally drawing it. Modern day graffiti was introduced around the 1960s and 1970s. Graffiti first took place in New York and Philadelphia. People who used spray, spray cans that would create images on buildings and on the sides of trains. This soon became more popular, more people started doing it. Then this form of art became gang related. Gangs across the U.S. would spray paint buildings or even homes and mark their territory. Teenagers and kids most often would participate in graffiti. Throughout time, graffiti has been used in many different places. One of the most common being in prisons and jails. In the 1970s, prisoners were brought to the Hendricks County Jail. Many of these inmates would write their names and clothes on the wall. 
This graffiti is still displayed on the walls of the museum today. Some of the graffiti on the walls display the name of a 70 R&B band, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Hundreds of other names are displayed on the wall, and these names have an even deeper meaning. During this time, two boys escaped from a boys' school in Plainfield and were on the run. The two boys, who were later believed to steal a car and auto parts, were arrested at the Hendricks County Jail and wrote graffiti on the walls. The two boys' names cannot be shared due to privacy reasons. In the following skits, we are going to be showing you the two boys escaping from the school and being caught weeks later. So we'll be here forever. For our artifact, we have the 1948 Admiral TV. This TV was much smaller than any other TVs at the time, sitting at a 16 inch wide and 9 inch tall with a 6 by 6 inch screen. It was originally a radio, but then they later added a screen to make it a TV. Back then, you had to pay roughly $200 for this model, but others were much more expensive. The company was created by Ross David Saragusa in 1934 under the name Clarion. Later, in 1942, they bought the rights to the name Admiral. The company then took flight in 1947 when they started to add a screen. The TV's value increased and was bought more in the 50s. Even though the TV was still very expensive and were viewed as luxurious items, they were still cheaper than the competition. On this TV, they only had 12 networks, which was revolutionary for the time. You would get to these networks by turning the knob in the center. The most popular networks were NBC, ABC, and CBS. The knob on the left adjusts the contrast, and the knob on the right adjusts the volume. Hey, honey, I'm home. I got this new TV from Dave's. Oh, really? Yeah, I thought we were going to college football on it. Check if the rest of the dog's bowl is full or not. I don't think I saw that all the way. Fine. It's on. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
tonight, live from New York, The Ed Sullivan Show. And now... <sighs> yeah, no, Rusty's bowl is filled to the brim. Hey, what's that smell? I think, I think it's dinner. Oh, really? Can you go check? Yeah, yeah, no, I can go. Try this again. Ah, okay. Thank you. Yes, day and day I feel it's the jam of newspaper and hundreds of dark moral of the nation, and these veterans agree with me. Yeah, it was just it was just a mug from the top cabinet. It should be fine though. Is that is that Timmy outside? Oh, you better not be. Yeah. Whoa! Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm fine. Actually, how about we watch Dick Van Dyke? It's a great idea. The dress being shown is an example of what the common school dress looked like in this time period. The dress measures 34 inches from shoulder to hem and 14 inches from shoulder to waist. It was machine stitched and was lined with an older fabric that may have been reused. Though the sleeves of this dress would end around elbow length, the dress is considered short sleeved. Owner at a baker could be found using this dress near Pittsboro, Indiana, a mere 11 miles away from the museum. Like this one, dresses in the 1920s were geared towards comfort and movability for playing and having fun as a kid. To make this possible, fabrics such as cotton and wool were used every day in articles of clothing like jerseys, skirts, cardigans, and shorts. Cotton and wool, both strong fabrics, can hold up to the rough play and weather without the worry of a mess afterwards. Clothing of the time period no longer took hours of particular cleaning. The ones every day turned into specialty. Velvet, lace, and silk were only used by the rich and were used for certain circumstances. Children's clothing became very practical and simple in its ways. However, there was a major difference between boys' and girls' clothing. In the 1920s, girls usually wore dresses to look elegant and proper. These dresses were typically loose and shorter in length, taking away from the more restrictive clothing of the earlier centuries. Small, lighter cardigans or sweaters could be paired with these dresses. Clothes like this from shops would cost anywhere from 89 cents to $8.50. Some of the styles girls' dresses include baby doll, sailor style, and drop waist dresses. Shoes were made up of a rough-like texture, but soft on the feet. Flexibility was found in the outfit. Girls used to wear their hair long and down most of the time, but in the 1920s, they started to cut their hair in a bob, which was oftentimes done at home. To make this hairstyle more fashionable, they frequently paired it with an adorable ribbon or a bow. Young boys, up until they were teenagers, wore trousers, mostly knee length, for the entirety of the year. Over the years, the trousers shortened in length, ending just above the knees. During the summer months, boys wore short socks with sandals or canvas-style shoes. During the winter months, boys wore tall, thick socks with these same type of shoes. If it was chilly outside, the boys would pair their school outfit with a light cardigan, usually knitted. 
When the boys were younger, they would wear pants with a matching jacket or shirt over top a pair of overalls. Prices would range from $1.98 up to $16.45, considerably more expensive than girls' clothing. Before these styles, it was common to find plenty of day-to-day -day women sewing clothes not only for themselves or family, but for profits. Fabric sales throughout the 1920s happened to turn lethargic or sluggish from the uprising of ready-made clothing. Of course, sewing was cheaper in some aspects. You had to take into account of money, time, and the skills needed to create. If you weren't able to or decided it would be easier not to sew, your option was to buy from companies. <laughs> some of the favorite companies of the time were, but not limited to, Coco Chanel, Madeleine Vionette, Elsa Schiaparelli, Jean Pateau, Jean Lanvin, and numerous other household names. Honey, come in. I think the radio is turning on. Oh, is it a commercial? Uh, yeah, it's from that one fashion place nearby. What's that called? Coco. Co Coco Chanel. Uh, that's uh, the one. Well, let's take a listen. Are you tired of your same old dress? Want to have some clothes you can breathe in? Coco Chanel is the place for you. We've got all the styles and fashion trends. Luxurious soft con fabrics, beautiful shades, we ever going. The casual clothes for day to day activities are made to fit your needs. Whether you're feeling sporty or just going to relax in your favorite chair, since 1913, Chanel has been a household name. Our goal is to have affordable prices and clothes that make you shine. Coco go Chanel, in order to be irreplaceable, one must always be different. So innovative. Amazing. Be beautiful. Magnus. Shop at Coco today and be the coolest kid skill. <sighs> I think I'd like to shop there now. Well, better go get my wallet. Oh, wait for me. Children's clothing in the 1920s as a whole was meant to be innocent and lighthearted. Earlier Victorian ideas remained the same, revolving around the sacred part of childhood. Growing older stayed the same, but it seems that the fashion trends did not. Even though they aren't that far apart in age, there are many differences between the early childhood ages and that of the older ones. Teenagers today are always a handful, and having a teenager in the 1920s was no different. Teenagers were highly exposed to adult life at an early age. Dressing like an adult was the fashion and kitty being cool. You could easily find adolescent girls' fashion following those of a woman's, including fun hats, flapper style dresses, and tall stockings hidden underneath a long, elegant skirt. These skirts were often made from wool, but could be found in other materials, like cotton. Drop waist dresses were also very popular during this time, because they had a lower waistband, resting at the top of the hips, helping to create the illusion that the teen's torso was elongated. This dress gave the torso a box-like figure, which was seen as elegant and beautiful at the time. On the other hand, teen's boy's clothing was similar to that of a male adult. This style consisted of long pants and a shirt, usually buttoned up, over top. The shirts they wore were mainly vibrant and colorful and had some sort of pattern like stripes. Over these shirts, the young men would wear dressed up suits and a variety of colors made for dancing and comfortability. These colors would often consist of blues, grays, and neutral colors. They would pair these suits with dressed shoes, usually needing to be laced up. The outfit would be worn almost everywhere with some exceptions. Teenagers in the 1920s were fun, new, and exciting. Although the word teenager was not used in the 1920s, a line was created between younger and older children. Responsibilities, fashion, and styles were not the same between these two very seemingly similar groups. The artifact we chose to research is the Handmade Dollhouse in the Hendricks County Museum. It was donated to the museum in 1985 by Ruth Harmon and Bobby Piercy. We do not have much information about Ruth Harmon, but we do know Bobby Piercy was a local artist that lived in Danville, Indiana. The dollhouse has every room you'll need. It has three bedrooms, a bathroom, a dining room, a kitchen, and two living rooms. It has an antique look on the outside and has nice white accents around the house. It has a porch in the front for your dolls to relax on. A dollhouse of this quality is typically worth around $1,600. Dollhouses built like this can be seen throughout the decades in Hindus County, specifically in the 4-H Fair. The category it is under is called the Models Exhibit. The Model Exhibit consists of builds such as figures, motorcycles, dollhouses, and other wood models. You can't typically see dollhouses like this nowadays. Now they are being manufactured and commercially sold all over the world. When you think of dollhouses, most people think of the worldwide known company Barbie. Barbie was first sold in 1968 by Ruth Handler. She was inspired by watching her little daughter playing with paper dolls. She quickly became famous and grew to be known all over the world. She started producing dollhouses, dolls, and much more. 
In the following skit, you will see how dollhouses have evolved into what they are today. In the 17th century, dollhouses were not used for playing. They were used to display wealth. The dollhouses were built out of glass and remained locked from other people for the majority of time. Throughout time, dollhouses changed. During the 19th and 20th century, dollhouses were finally normal to play with. They also became more industrial and affordable. These dollhouses do not compare to the dollhouses seen today. We now want to introduce you to the original creator of Barbie, Ruth Handler. She is known worldwide for her famous creation of Barbie. Hi. I'm Ruth Handler. Let me tell you the story about how Barbie was created and how dollhouses have evolved into what they are today. It took three years for Ruth to finally get Barbie on the market. She named Barbie after her daughter Barbara, who encouraged her idea the entire time. Mattel Inc. finally agreed and set the launch date for March 9, 1959. The dolls were 11 inches tall and sold for around $3. Three years later, they came out with their first Barbie dream house, and it sold for $4.44. The house was made out of cardboard, and to later years, the houses were produced out of plastic. The houses quickly became popular, and it grew the company tremendously. Now the dream house sells for $200 and are sold all over the world. In 1973, she retired from the president position of Patel Inc. After retiring, she sold other women's products and never got into the childhood toy business again. Ruth Handler died on April 27, 2002, at the age of 85. She was diagnosed with colon cancer in the 1970s and battled for over 30 years. Our artifact is a wooden ballot box dating from the 1920s to the 1940s, but older versions dated all the way back to the ancient Greek times. They're around 5 inches tall, 7 inches wide, and 12 inches long with a handle on the side. It's a wooden box with a hole in it where you could either put a black or a white marble. Our ballot box was used in the Psi Chi Omega sorority at Central Normal College here in Danville, Indiana in the 1920s, but all of the other fraternities and sororities at that time used boxes just like this one. Our specific bat box was donated by Maxine Osborne, who was in the Psi Chi Omega herself. A sorority is a college organization for women, and then a fraternity is a college organization for men. The ballot box was a secure way for people to vote in the colleges, where they put a bar marble in the hole depending on what they voted. When the fraternity or sorority members voted, if there were more black balls than white, the person would not be voted in, which is where the term blackballed comes from. People used the box to vote for accepting someone into a sorority or fraternity, or in addition could vote for someone who's becoming president. These were organizations that you'd find in colleges, like the old college in Danville, Central Normal. The people of Psi Chi Omega and other organizations at Central Normal would sometimes meet up in a place called the Lincoln Hotel in Indianapolis. The following skit is what we imagined a meeting of a fraternity like the Theta Delta Ta would look like. Introducing the, the Ballot, Ballot Box! Box. On that note, I think this meeting is concluded. Actually, wait, there is one more thing. In case you haven't noticed, there's a new kid here at Central Normal College. His name is Sam Williams. He came over here from Auburn University, and I don't know what you guys think, but I've talked to him a little bit, and he seems like a cool guy. Do you think I could ask him if he's interested in joining? Because ever since Gerald and Kenneth left, we haven't had a lot of people here. Yeah, sure. Ask him if he wants to join, and we'll make an initiation process. Bro, I was on Sam. I've been meeting to talk to you. So yeah. I'm in this cool club. We meet every week at the Lincoln Hotel and talk about like school and sports stuff. Would you be interested in joining that? Yeah, sure. What do I have to do though? So like you sign a paper and the the members vote you in. And there is one more thing. Yeah, what is it? I'm up for anything. You know. Well, there's this initiation ritual. It's different for every person. So I don't exactly know what you're doing, but it's been kind of harsh in the past. Are you sure you're up for it? Yeah, let's just hope it's not horrible. All right, let's go talk to the club. I really hope they'll let you in. Okay. For those who don't know, we have a new member of our club. Well, he's not really in our club, but he should be very soon. His name is Sam Williams, and if he completes the rituals, then we'll vote him in. Come on, Sam. So I'm supposed to talk to them. Um, hey guys. Um, I just want to say that I'm honored to be in this fraternity, and um, what do I need to do to get in? All right, first, go ahead and sign at the bottom. Thank you. All right, now raise your right hand and repeat after me. 
I, Sam Williams. I, Sam Williams. Swear to never share the secrets discussed. Swear to never discuss the secrets. I'll always follow the rules set in place. I'll always follow the rules set in place. And obey the president at all costs. I'll obey the president at all costs. All right. Okay, for the final thing, we have a little ritual for the people who want to join. You know, just to prove that they're trustworthy. All right. We so. decided for you that you're going to eat the spiciest pepper that the general store has to offer. We'll make you eat it tomorrow. Joe, you're in charge of getting it. Alright, so here's the pepper you have to eat. Come on, that's all you gotta do. Well, how is it? Come on. Uh-oh. Oh. Okay, dude. I hope you feel better soon. Yeah, my tongue still feels like it's on fire. But um, now that I've done my initiation, what else is needed? Well, all that's left is to vote you in. We have this cool thing called a ballot box, and there's white and black marbles. And if someone puts a white marble in, that means they want you to be in. But if they put a black ball in, that means they don't want you in. And since our group is pretty large, if you get three black marbles, you're out or black ball. What are we waiting for? Let's begin the voting. All right, has everyone voted? Yep. All right, I'm going to count them now. <laughs> Attention, everyone. The results of the vote are in. And Sam is in the club. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, nice job. Our artifact is the Central Normal College Quarterly from May of 1937. The quarterly is 7 by 10 inches and is made of paper. It was published every three months. The college originated in 1876. It had all traditional courses but was known for training teachers. The college was first founded in Ladoga and was moved to Danville in 1878. In 1940, the college was sold to the Episcopal Church and was renamed Canterbury College. The college was closed in 1946 after enrollment declined after World War II and reopened the next year. Financial difficulties forced Canterbury to close in 1951 permanently. The quarterly mentioned when Lillian Boyd won prom queen with her attendants Bernice Roik, Order Williams, Clara Mae Voiles, and Catherine Hoovers. They were judged off of perfection, community value, and journalist quality. Along with other important people from the college, Marjorie Yaston was the faculty at Central Normal College since September of 1955. Miss Marjorie Gaston left to complete a master's degree in musical arts at DePaul University. Marjorie was elected to membership in Phi Kappa Lamba, which refers to Phi Beta Kappa of Arts College, a membership by honor and invitation only. They are extended to undergraduate and graduate music students. After graduating, Marjorie Gaston went on to become a member of the faculty at Central Normal College starting September of 1955. The following skit will show Lillian Boyd winning prom queen as shown in the 1937 quarterly. In her speech, she will be talking about her life in the college. The skit will also include Miss Marjorie Gaston's journey at the Central Normal College. The college decided prom queens based off of their best community value, journalist quality, and perfection. The college focused on changing people to become the best versions of themselves. A lot of people have graduated happily from the Central Normal College, including Miss Marjorie Gaston. Marjorie Gaston has done so much stuff for the college and the community. The college was so successful that it even opened up opportunities for Marjorie. After being at the college, she was able to transfer to DePaul University, which soon opened up musical jobs for her in 1955. Marjorie was awarded the Phi Beta Kappa Award, 
at DePaul University, which was given by invitation only. Welcome to our 1937 prom at the Central Normal College. It's time to announce our prom queen of the year. Our prom queen is Lillian Boyd and her attendants Bernice Rourke, Ora Williams, Clara Mae Boyles, and Katherine Hoovers. Congratulations to Lillian. Woo! I just want to thank you all for this award. Even though I may look the most perfect, have the best journalist quality, and have the best community value, it's really all about the school and what they do for us. Thank you all again, and you all looked beautiful tonight. The artifact we chose to research is the Cox Family Bible. The measurements for the Bible are 10 inches by 12 inches by 4 inches. The Bible has gold accents on both front and back, and both the Old and New Testaments inside. There are also Catholic prayers located throughout. These pages are very colorful with many, many illustrated images throughout and photographs of the family members. In the back of the Bible are the family records for the Cox Family. Through the 1700s and the 1800s, family Bibles were used to hold and record important documents. They recorded documents such as marriage records, birth and death dates, and they kept track of the family's generation over many years. Since government records were hard to obtain, people had to record family history in their Bibles. It also allowed an opportunity for younger generations to learn of their ancestral history. For middle and lower class families, the Bible was considered a prized possession and was passed down for many generations. Most people who have received their ancestors' Bible have said that it was like reconnecting with their loved ones from the past. The Bible dates all the way back to 1849 when it was made and given to Daniel Cox when he was 20 years old. Daniel was born on July 28, 1827, and he died on June 4, 1890. He is the youngest of a family of four, and he has an older sister named Jane Cox. Growing up in Hendricks County, he received a very good education going to school in Hendricks County, and later attended college. He was working in the Tanner's trade when his dad unfortunately passed away, leaving him to take care of his family. Later on in Daniel's life, he became a teacher and taught for about two years. Daniel became the treasurer of the Indiana Horticultural Society while he was teaching. He was also the president of the Hendricks County Agricultural and Horticultural Society, and the president of Farmers Corporative Insurance Company of Hendricks County before he met his, his wife, Elizabeth Little. Elizabeth was born on March 10, 10, 1833, and she died on May 14, 1923. Daniel Cox married Elizabeth Little on April 15, 1852. The couple had 11 children, but their seventh child only lived for two years. Daniel and Elizabeth Little Cox built their brick barn and house in 1864 through 1867, which still stands today. The farm, consisting of 320 acres of land east of Cartersburg, has been sold over the years. Though part of the house has changed today, it still retains its character, such as its stairs, woodwork, windows, and fireplaces. During the 1860s, the Civil War was going on. It is unclear if Daniel or any of his children have joined in the military. We will now show you an example of what the family would have done with the Bible after a birth or a death. September 15, 1858. Dear Mother, we hope this finds you well. We write with exciting news. Our little family has grown with the birth of a bouncing baby boy. We have named him Horace Mann Cox, after the educator who is such a champion of public education. We now have the perfect balance of two daughters and two sons. When harvest is over here on the farm, we look forward to visiting with you. Love, Daniel and Elizabeth. April 15th. 1860. Dear Mother, it is with heavy hearts that we write to tell you that little Horace has died at the young age of almost two years old. Horace brought such joy to the family in the short time he was on earth. Knowing he is with our Father in heaven helps us through these sad days. Sadly, Daniel and Elizabeth.
Our Artifact is a shade stove company toaster made in 1925. This was the third electric toaster ever made. It was created out of metal, nickel, and sheet metal. The toaster is a four-slice swing toaster, which stands seven inches tall with a cord that is three inches long. Need bread in two processes. The ingredients for the long process consist of two tablespoons fat, two tablespoons of sugar, one half cake compressed yeast, or one cake dried yeast, one tablespoon of salt, one quart lukewarm liquid, three quarts of flour, one cup flour additional for kneading. They kneaded the dough with their hands. The quick process consisted of two Two, table, two, two tablespoons fat, two tablespoons sugar, one tablespoon salt, two cakes, two cake compressed yeast, one quart lukewarm liquid, three quart flour, one cup flour additional for the kneading. Your hand sliced bread had to be toasted on a long metal fork or in a metal frame, held over a fire or on a gas stove. Simple utensils for toasting bread over open flames appeared in the early 19th century. The company originated in 1842 in Hanging Rock, Ohio. The company was known as the Martin Henderson and Company when acquired February 21st, 1881 by the Kahn brothers, Lazard, Felix, and Sol. In 1882, the three brothers officially purchased the company, in which they would then rename to F&L Kahn Bros. In 1884, they then moved the foundry to Hamilton, Ohio. Unfortunately, Saul Kahn passed away in 1887, just three years after moving the foundation. He was then replaced by his brother, Samuel Kahn. Felix handled most of the company's general office and financial matters. Samuel supervised the outside sales of products. Lazard managed the mechanical aspects of the foundry and its products. The two five-story buildings and the paint shop to the right were accessed by unpaved roads and which were used by horse-drawn carriage in front of the two-story paint shop. The estate stove company were Lazard, Felix, and Saul. Sadly, in 1887, Saul Kahn passed away from natural causes. They then replaced him by another brother named Samuel Kahn. For our project, we chose artifacts from the Van Buren Elm Tree. The Hendricks County Museum preserved a section of the trunk and a clock made from the elm. Seven years after he was elected president, Van Buren was going to Illinois to talk to some congressmen about legislation. While he was traveling through Indiana on the National Road, his driver encountered many problems. The roads were terrible and were falling apart. Martin Van Buren was the eighth president of the United States and was elected in 1838. During his presidency, Van Buren vetoed a bill that would improve the national roads across the nation. While he was passing through Plainfield, his driver ran Van Buren's stagecoach over a tree root. This toppled the cart and sent Van Buren flying into the mud. This greatly affected Indiana and the way the citizens lived. Since they didn't get new roads, this caused many people to get injured. This tree would later be known as the Van Buren Elm. In the following skit, we are going to show how the crash might have looked. In 1942, Martin Van Buren and his stagecoach were driving through Plainfield when they took a tumble. Even though they did crash, the stagecoach driver and Martin were both okay. All they did was hit the side of their bodies into the ground. Fortunately, no one was injured. Once they did, once they did get, get up, they gathered their supplies and walked to the nearest shop. They went to the shop to gather new supplies and fix their cart. Unfortunately, when they went to the shop, they couldn't find the materials they needed to fix the cart. Not many people liked Martin Van Buren. When he did crash, they were pretty happy. The main reason that people hated Martin Van Buren is because of what he did during his presidency. During his time in office, he did not pass a bill that would have allowed Indiana and other states to improve the national road. Also, during his presidency, not many people liked him because he was power hungry. He thought he was the best and most important person in the world. About 84 years after Martin Van Buren crashed under the tree, it got struck by lightning and soon fell over. As soon as the tree hit the ground, it shattered into many pieces. 
Thankfully, a teacher in Plainfield saved a piece of the tree so she could use it for her class. The class she taught was fine arts. With the wood, her students worked together to make a clock to be displayed to others. The clock is about 12 and a half inches long and 5 inches tall. When the students finished making the clock, they wanted it to show the past and their creativity. During the same year, that is when the rock was marked by Caroline Scott Harrison. Caroline was the first lady of Benjamin Harrison. She thought that all Americans should know the past and learn from it. Thanks to her, we were able to do this project. Also because of her, we get to know more about Martin Van Buren and what he did for his life in Indiana. Artifact, we chose the Hadley Industrial School for Orphan Girls. Other schoolhouses just like this one were Pittsburgh 1883 One Room School. There were schoolhouses of what we now call today Cardsburg and schools in Brown Township. There is also the Central Academy at Plainfield. Today we will be talking about the Hadley Industrial School for Orphan Girls. There is no longer the school, but there are photos of the school in the Hendricks County Historical Museum. In 1890, Addison Hadley met up with his wife, Martha Hadley. They discussed to state officers of the Women Christian Temperance Union. They decided to make a school for girls that have worse living conditions than privileged girls. They wanted to give happiness to deserving orphan girls from the age 8 to 21. The WCTU guaranteed 110 acres of Hendricks County farm and woodland with the understanding that these Christians would solicit money to build a home that would house as many as 30 to 40 girls. The home was built during 1892 through 1893. It was built out of red brick more than two stories high and a slate roof. There was a large basement for laundry and the storing of products raised on the farm. The building stood on an eminence with a lovely wide yard and a slight walk sloping to the road that led to the town of Hatley. The location offered a fine view of the west, the south, the east, and the north. Governor Claude Matthews ran during 1893 to 1897. He was the 23rd governor of Indiana and he approved the school. They held the biggest ceremony in the history of Clay Township and the town of Hadley. The Plainfield Boys School Brass Band provided music. Hundreds of visitors came to watch. The school idea was going great and had high hopes, but after eight years, the home only had 30 girls, but the farm didn't produce enough food. The business mismanagement drove the institution even deeper in the red. It ran for 15 years and sadly closed. Weeds started to grow all over and the under bush took over the property. A couple years back, the building was raised and the bricks were made into the walls of Mr. and Mrs. Hadley's country home. Therefore, therefore the ideal image of having a perfect home for the orphan girls vanished. No higher service can be rendered to society than a proper preparation of girls to assume the natural and conventional responsibilities that will come to them. Housekeeping, cookery, sewing, music, and a general knowledge of horticulture and dairying enter as essentially as grammar and arithmetic to the young woman to be a queen of a family, once said by Addison Hadley. The next clip will show Martha and Addison Hadley talking to a member of the WCTU program about opening the school. So, what's your reason for opening the school? Well, we want to open the school for orphan girls who don't have many privileges at home. But what would you be teaching these girls? We want to teach these young girls the skills they need to be housewives one day. What skills might those be? Some of these skills would be cooking, cleaning, sewing, taking care of children, and hospitality. The following clip will show a member of the WCTU program talking to the rest of the union about the school. The topic is about Addison and Martha Hadley. They would like to open a school for orphan girls to teach them skills they need in the future. These are skills like cooking, sewing, cleaning, and how to be a parent. That sounds like a great idea. How much land would it require? Uh, they're asking for 100 acres, but I offered 110, so they have the extra just in case it gets a little packed. We should do it. The first Hendricks County Jail was built between 1830 and 1834. It was located on North Washington, about a half block from the courthouse square. No photographs of the first jail have been located. It was described as a two-story log structure, with an exterior stairway leading to the second floor. Below was a dungeon or cell area. The jail was surrounded by a high fence, which sometimes served as a holding pen for livestock, confiscated by the sheriff or town marshal. It was reported in Commissioner's Book 3 that the bedding was made of straw.
1838, the old jail was torn down and a new log jail was built in its place on the same site. The contract for the second jail stated the walls were to be two inches of square hewn timbers with a third thickness of timbers dropped endwise between them. The first payment of $735 was made to Cave J. Carter and Rucket K. Carter for the construction of the jail. Later, a final payment of $111.77 was made to the Carters. The third jail and the sheriff's residence was built in 1866 at 170S Washington Street. The jail had two areas, one for the men and the other for the woman. Today you can go to the Hendricks County Museum and look at parts of the jail and how they've changed. There you can see the whole room for yourself, including a painting made by a prisoner there. The painting is of a landscape with a plateau, a beach, and an ocean. It was made by an unknown prisoner around the time of 1962 to 1970, the term of Sheriff Merle Funk. Other paintings were made and lost by the same prisoner while he was serving his sentence, paintings such as portraits of the sheriff and his family. At this time, Fred Brown was serving an eight-month sentence for running away with the wife of Peter Meyer of Mounts Jackson while Charlie Heed was currently being given a one of 14-year sentence for stealing copper from Van Camp Co. The judge sentenced you to 14 years in the slammer. Good luck. You're gonna need it. No! no! As that was going on, Fred Brown was hard at work hammering away at the bars in an attempt to escape and later take Charlie Heed with him. Heed was thrown in the same cell with Brown with a very inconspicuous window. Oh! Oh! Get the slammer! Heed and Brown plotted their escape. What are you in for? I stole some copper from Van Game Go. Oh, how embarrassing. How many years? Uh, 14. Van Camp Co. was a tomato canning company. Fortunately for you, I have an escape plan. See those bars? These bars right here? Yeah, we're gonna leave through them. <laughs> I'll blow this popsicle stand! <laughs> Later that day, Sheriff Gentry found the remains of the prisoner's escape. Zoinks! Brown and he both managed to escape. Hey, you suckers! You can't catch me! Our artifact is the Stilesville Cemetery. Stilesville started to begin as a town in 1823. Jeremiah Stiles, the founder of Stilesville, settled in Franklin Township, followed by his wife Sybil Stiles, John Stewart, John and Isaac Wilcox, John Eastlinger, David Osborne, and Jacob Reese. The township was founded shortly after the organization of Hendricks County. Samuel Wicks was the first merchant, and Dr. Mahan was the first physician. On January 16, 1827, Sybil Stiles died at the age of 33 years old due to unknown causes. She was buried on the Stiles property on a knoll just west of the present cemetery itself. Jeremiah did the land for the first section of the cemetery and had her body removed to the east side of the cemetery, which is also the first section. In the following years, there were nine other burials from the years of 1831 to 1839. These burials included John McAfee, Joseph Woods, Joel Garrison, Sarah Lee, Zilla Newton, Ann Lewis, Reuben Woods, Sarah J. Borders, and Rebecca Borders, along with Sybil. During the late 1840s, the gold rush was a popular event in history. The gold rush was an influence of fortune seekers trying to find gold to their best ability. The gold rush took place in California, and most of the travelers were from the western side of the U.S. There was few people from the eastern side of the U.S. and would, who would travel to California, but the travelers were able to access the Old National Road to benefit to reaching the destination of California. The Old National Road was built from 1811 to 18... 
34, and went through the town of Stilesville, which, why tra- which is why travelers would often make a stop. The old national road today is called U.S. Highway 40. A traveling group from Ohio would be able to make history in Stilesville Cemetery, although through unfortunate events of a wagon train tragedy. The wagon train tragedy took place in the year of 1849. The people traveling were from Ohio going to the Gold Ru- California Gold Rush. On the eve of the tragedy, the travelers stopped near the town of Stilesville, two miles east from the town itself. The group from Ohio pur- purchased new produce from residents of the local area. Corn specifically was prepared and made for the evening meal for the, that night, and the remainder of the corn was left in a copper kettle and was also eaten the next morning. Ten hours from eating the leftover corn from the morning, many became ill. This would result in people being killed from food poisoning. Most reports and accounts state that there were 19 travelers that had died from, from the wagon train tragedy, and their graves remained unmarked. No one knows who was really involved. In times like these, we have no words. We must rely on each other. Today, we gather to honor the passing of those who have died in unfortunate events who have come to the conclusion of their lives. Sybil Stiles, the wife of the founder of Stilesville, Jeremiah, the nine other residents who have passed, and some who would die in a tragedy. May the people and citizens rest in peace. <laughs> chosen is a painting that resigns back to the old Hendricks County Jail. This painting is of the town in Belleville and it was made by William E. Henshaw. This painting may be simple but it has a crazy backstory. William E. Henshaw was born in July 1865 in Randolph County, Indiana. He then later married Thursa Ollier, born November 21, 1868. In 1892, William ran for election and lost. He, he became a Methodist preacher in 1894 and William and Thursa moved to Belleville, Indiana. Henshaw was accused of murdering his wife and then took into trial. Henshaw was defended by Enoch G. Hogate and the judge was John V. Hadley. Henshaw claims that two intruders came in and shot him and his wife. The trial was a long and memorable case. They even brought in Henshaw's bed to try and reenact the scene. Circumstantial evidence used in this case is still studied today. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that must be true based on the circumstances. While circumstantial evidence isn't always true, it's a good way to help us in court cases. Henshaw was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with a chance of parole. When Henshaw was in jail, he had one side of the jail to himself and was very comfortable. Even though he was a murderer, he was well respected and was brought many gifts. He would often be seen praying and reading scriptures to the other cellmates. This is where he created his painting. Here is our presentation explaining the backstory of the Henshaw painting. As Henshaw burst through his front door, all of his neighbors would soon learn later that his wife had been murdered in her Henshaw claims that two intruders broke into his house and came in and shot him and his wife while his wife was sleeping. Henshaw quickly got out of bed and tried to defend himself, but he was shot in the arm. His wife was killed, laying murdered on the bed. They soon escaped from his house and he wasn't able to find any track of them. In trial, Henshaw stated that two intruders broke into his home and shot his wife while she was sleeping, and he tried to defend himself with his gun. We later find out in the court case what truly happened that morning that Henshaw's wife was murdered. Henshaw got out of bed, put on his coat, walked over to the gun safe, and shot his wife point blank in the head. This is what really happened the day that Henshaw's wife was murdered. Henshaw didn't want to leave a trace of his murder, so he went and hid the murder weapon. He tried to hide it somewhere in his yard, so the cops couldn't find it. Later, the police searched all around the home and eventually found the weapon, 
and they linked it to Henshaw's murder. 